Crybaby locks eight young women in a house for one week. One million yen, or about five thousand pounds, goes to the girl who can cry the most tears in that week. Crying is a shared emotional experience, something we all do. So why was it once so maligned that it was actually called emotional incontinence? Yep, according to Thomas Dixon, writing for Aeon, emotional incontinence is a term that 19th century psychologists used when describing what they deemed an uncouth public act. You see, crying wasn't always an acceptable expression of the inner state. It was seen as a sign of weakness and vulnerability, on par with urinating or defecating in public. But today, even grown men in suits can turn on the waterworks. Well, as long as it's related to sports or country, take Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, who recalled his, quote, hot tears of patriotic pride, unquote, at the opening ceremonies of the 2012 Olympics. We produce 10 ounces of tears a day, and the majority of it serves to lubricate the the eyes and keep them dust and debris free. So what's the purpose of sobbing? Is it just to accompany the contorted faces of sorrow, anger, and joy? One clue is that emotional tears have different molecular content than basic maintenance tears called basal and reflex tears. Basal tears have three different layers to keep dirt and debris in check, while reflex tears spring forth when the eye is injured, flushing away the offending substance and offering up antibodies in case any microorganism breached the periphery. But emotional tears contain higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol and encephalin, an endorphin and natural painkiller, all of which points to the mood-stabilizing effects of weeping. Consider the 2008 research of University of South Florida psychologists who looked at 3,000 crying-related studies and found that although emotional tears caused increased heart rate and sweating, the calming effects, like slow breathing, lasted longer than the negative ones. Now, this was the case in only those who reported improvements in their mood following a bout of crying, which was the majority of respondents. However, one-third of the survey participants reported no improvement in mood, and a tenth felt worse after crying. The researchers found that those whose moods were enhanced after bawling their eyes out had received emotional support from others, which could be a key to the social significance of crying. Dutch psychologist Ad Wingerhoots posits that tears may just be a way of socially signaling. He and psychiatrist John Bowlby look to early childhood bonds between mother and child, in which crying plays a major role. Fingerhoats's take is that early humans' use of emotional tears was a far less risky signal than, say, a scream to communicate distress without raising the hackles of any nearby predators. To support this, he points to the enlarged visual cortex in humans, a structure that allows us to read subtle signaling in the face, whether it's a microexpression, blushing, or tears. Moreover, when Fingerhoat showed study participants a Hollywood tearjerker in his lab, they reported feeling better after a cry, but only if they were with a friend. When they viewed the tearjerker alone, participants mostly reported no improvement in mood at all. Perhaps this is further evidence of the social function of crying. Something to think about the next time you have an ocular ejaculation. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out these three videos as well. And don't forget to visit us at StuffToBlowYourMind.com. Of course there's crying in outer space, but who knew it was such an otherworldly experience? Luckily for us, International Space Station Commander Chris Hadfield breaks it all down for us in this video. Have you ever ever started to cry and you got a lump in your throat? First, don't be ashamed. We all cry. When it comes to babies crying, scientists don't entirely agree whether their facial expressions match whatever kind of emotion is going on inside of them.